was blind, but now I see so clearly. Hallelujah, praise like rain is falling down on me. Hallelujah, all my stains are washed away, they're washed away. Seems like all I could see was the struggle. Haunted by a ghost that lived in my past. Bound up in shackles of all of my failures. Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains Wipe away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed And set me free My life I have been called unworthy by the voice of my shame and regret. 
But when I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be because I don't have to be the old man inside of me because his day is long dead and gone because I've got a new name, a new life, I'm not the same. I hope it will carry me You set me free, so I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain, now I'm not who I used to be, I am redeemed, you set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. Now I'm not who I used to be. Oh, I'm not who I used to be. Jesus, I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. God redeemed. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. A daily walking close to Just a closer walk with thee. 
Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is over. morning and I am betting that's because it's the last weekend before school starts and I have lots of important announcements to make this morning because of September coming up so you have a job and your job is to help share the kinds of things that I am sharing with you this morning okay so your job is to because they can't hear you Share. Okay, I'm going behind the pulpit just for a moment. For a moment. Because we've got young ears. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Yes. Good morning, church. Lots of announcements this morning because of exciting things that have happened are getting ready to happen in our church. You're going to hear about during our worship service some today things that have happened. So we're going to talk a little bit about the past in the service, but I want to talk to you this morning about the future. So I've got a few things to let you know about. The first thing is, reminder, blood drive, Tuesday, 1 to 6. This Tuesday, blood drive, 1 to 6. We need at least 19 donors to meet our quota, so sign up or show up, both would be good, to sign up and show up. But you can sign up ahead of time for that. So Tuesday, blood drive. Mark your calendars. There will be a homecoming meeting Tuesday at 2 p.m., Homecoming meeting, Tuesday at 2 p.m. in room 131. Donations to the resale shop can be dropped off on Tuesdays from 1 to 3. If you would like to know more about and let me tell you, there are awesome ministries happening there. All you need to do is talk to Marsha and Craig a few minutes, and they can tell you about all kinds of new and exciting things going on there. But donations can now be dropped off on Tuesdays, 1 to 3. And on the back of your bulletins, there's uh, weekly offerings and meeting times. You can find that. And then the two biggies that I want to announce, except this. Did you tell me one thing that's not on my list? No, Okay. Okay, the two biggies are starting September 1st, 
we the results of our survey were that about 30% of you wanted to be in one place called the sanctuary. About 30, 33% of you wanted to be in one place called the fellowship hall. And about 30% of you wanted us to meet together no matter where we meet. So we have come up with the worship team with a plan that we think is going to meet everyone's needs. Starting the first Sunday in September, we are returning to two services. We will have a 9 a.m. service in here. No fellowship hall. I mean, no, 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 no. Erase that. Everyone erase. Everyone show me your erasers. Erase, erase, erase. <laughs> we will have a 9 a.m. service that is in the fellowship hall with the band as our music. See, y'all confused me because you're in here now in the fellowship hall in the band at nine. There will be Sunday school in the middle and at 11.15, what time? 11.15. When was it? 11.15. 11.15, we will have worship in here that will be choir and organ and a little more traditional. The big services of the year, like Easter, homecoming, Pentecost. There's one more. What did I miss? Christmas. 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 Yes, Christmas <laughs> will be. Christmas will be in here. And then we're going to do something brand new, something brand new, and we're even going to call it out of the box. On fifth Sundays. We will do a joint service in the fellowship hall. It will not be recorded, and it will be exciting and new things. It'll be different. It'll be a chance to interact with one another and have worship. So every fifth Sunday, there's usually four in a year, the first one in September, we will all meet together and we'll do something different. That's why we're calling it what? Out of the box. Out of the box. Will it be like regular worship? No. No, it's going to be... Out of the box, different, right, and then the other two services. So that's the biggie, that is the biggie, that starting September 1st, yes. We think that one's going to be at 10, but I don't want to confuse you at this point, but we'll get that out because it's just a, it's a full together, but I don't want to confuse you on that at this point. So just mark that it's together on 5th Sunday. In September, there is a new season in the liturgical calendar called the season of creation. That also corresponds with uh, the time that we typically do our stewardship about in the broad sense here. So in September, we will be focusing our worships, the four Sundays that are regular Sundays, on stewardship and creation. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So we want you to know about that. So that's the announcements. What's the biggie? Two services. Two services. Starting when? First September Sunday. 1st. Okay. Mm -hmm. See you there. Now, welcome. Where is Sean? Right here. Close. Behind you. Oh. Uh -huh. Unless you want me to welcome. Oh, you're doing a great job. Uh -huh. Welcome. <laughs> If you are visiting with us, we really want to welcome you this morning. We are, part, we are First Christian Church, Washington, North Carolina. We are a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. And we here in Washington try to live that out, the oneness of all of us, and by our love. And we are going to hear today how that love has been embraced. So welcome to First Christian Church. Uh, if you're visitors with us, you're already family, so just act like family while you're here. <coughs> Let us uh, join together in worship. Rise as you're able. Let's have Rise a little talk with able. Jesus. Here we go. Once was lost in sin, but Jesus took me in, and then a little light from heaven filled my soul. It bathed my heart in love and wrote my name above, and just a little talk with Jesus made me whole. Here I face from the answer. 
Good morning. For those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Joanne Curvin, and I work for Beaufort County Schools. When I tell people that I work for Beaufort County Schools, <coughs> they inevitably ask, what do you teach? I'm not a teacher, and for many people are probably very grateful about that, <laughs> but I work with a group of dedicated, big-hearted employees to feed the students in Beaufort County. Yep, I am the lunch lady. <laughs> I believe that it's hard for us to identify our own talents or gifts. We don't like our egos to rule, so we don't really think about it. I'm blessed, however, because many years ago, a clergy member suggested to me that I had the gift of hospitality. I liked the sound of that. When you do what you love, you love what you do. Each morning, I have the privilege of getting up, going to work, and sharing my God-given gift with the students in Beaufort County. I have a team of about 70 during the school year that shrinks considerably during the summer months as many of my staff like to stay home with their own children. We like to operate the summer meals program here in Beaufort County. Please note, I call it summer meals, not summer feeding like a lot of our other counties. To me, that sounds like going to the zoo and watching the animals getting their meals. So we operate the summer meals program. We are acutely aware that many children here do not have the luxury or even basic requirements when it comes to receiving a nutritionally balanced meal when school is out. The Summer Meals Program is an outreach program to provide meals to anybody 18 or under. Because we are rural and many of our families are low income, we are able to provide both a breakfast and a lunch at no cost for the family. The outreach is actually twofold, as my staff are 10-month employees, and by offering the staff the opportunity to work over the other two months, they are also able to take home a small paycheck. <laughs> Note the word small. This summer, First Christian Church operated one of our meal sites for us. They operated a pickup site at P.S. Jones Memorial Park. This church has a number of volunteers to give their time to assist this tremendous outreach program. If you're here today and you helped me out over the summer, would you mind standing up just to be recognized one moment? I know a few of you are here. I think they deserve a round of applause. Thank you. I know that some of these people actually felt a little bit bad because they felt they didn't do very much work for us. However, if I tell you that our program this summer in Beaufort County served 38,500 meals to children 18 and under, I think you'll all realize that every bit counts and how important that is. Thank you very much. Yeah, you heard it right. It was 38,500 meals we served this summer. Not one person can do that on their own. Whatever they say, they can't. It takes a team, and I want to say thank you very, very much to all the volunteers here in First Christian Church that helped make that goal achievable this year. We actually served 12,000 more meals this summer than we did last summer. So a program that's growing can be good, but there's also a downside to that too, isn't it? It means our need is increasing in the county, and we need to be very aware of that. I'm really grateful for the team and the partnership here. First Christian Church is an amazing place to be, and I'm honored to be a member of this church. Thank you to everybody. School Nutrition and the team from Beaufort County Schools appreciates you more than you will ever know. On the final note, for those of you that may not be competitive, we served 600 meals more than St. Peter's Episcopal Church did. <laughs> <laughs> just saying I'm n I personally am not competitive I just like to win <laughs> thank you
Oh, she's good. Joe, come back with Nancy's prayer. <laughs> now you know why I didn't go up there. Thank God for laughter. <laughs> Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we gather in your presence, mindful of the words of Jesus, who is the living bread that sustains our souls. We give thanks for the challenges of life, knowing they shape us and help us grow. Strengthen our willingness to work toward fulfilling your mission on earth as stewards of this planet and caretakers of the beautiful gift of creation you've entrusted to us. Guide us to support one another, lifting each other up and strengthening the bonds that unite us rather than sowing division. We give thanks for your son, for his wisdom, his teachings, and the ultimate sacrifice he made for us all. Through him, we find the fullness of life and hope for the future. And now we join together in the prayer he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Rise as you're able and join us in singing, leaning on the everlasting arms.
as we gather at this table at this time in our worship, we're always lifting up ways that we love God and give back just as we prepare for how God loves us to follow this part. Joe, thank you. Thank you for all of the work that uh, you did. There you are. You moved. Thank you for all of the work that you did because without you, those 38,000 meals would not have happened. So thank you. Yesterday, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yesterday was another amazing day at First Christian Church Washington. As I heard someone say earlier this morning, we had three, not one, not two, but three major outreach events going on simultaneously, and none of them lacked in the staff to run them. Wow, that is amazing, church. That is amazing. And as we get ready to talk about stewardship in September, that is an example of your stewardship, that all of those places had the volunteers to make them happen. There were the Boy Scouts. I think Robbie's here. Uh, the Boy Scouts were out there helping with Green Chalice and getting our planters ready. They were uh, putting dirt and uh, all kinds of shoveling hard work. So they were there doing that. And they had their, uh, we had part of our green team out there with them. The mission building, the uh, Clyde Robertson mission building with the CIA in it was out there with the thrift store open and they had some wonderful sales and they have tons of exciting things coming up, but that was working. And at the same time, underneath our little shelter here, we gave away, not counting your donations, not counting your physical donations, over a thousand dollars worth of school supplies. My guess is if we counted all of those donations people brought in, because there were a lot of them, that we're probably talking around $2,000 in donations. Wow! There is nothing, there is nothing that marks us any more as Christians than the way we reach out. They will know we are Christians by our love. That's the only way people have to know that we are Christians, is by our love. All of those wonderful things happened because of you. You make the ministry of this church happen. You make it happen. You make it happen through the offerings that you give of your time, of the items you bring in, of your financial resources that keep this building open. Because if this building wasn't open, then we couldn't do all of the wonderful things that we do in the name of God. So this morning, as we gather our offerings, be reminded that these offerings are your ways of expressing God's love within you. Let us receive our morning offering.
When we gather at this table each week, there's familiar words that we say. I don't know if you know where they come from. They're not just from the Gospels, they're also from Paul. So when we gather at this table and we break bread and we drink from this cup, we are usually hearing some words that have come from the Gospels, listen closely, of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that have come from the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the Apostle Paul. These are the words that we say at this table. That is where they come from. They come from in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where Jesus sits down at a table with his disciples on the night of the Passover. And they come from Paul in that in Paul we hear the first time the oldest recognition of the Lord's Supper in Paul's letters as he tells people what to do as they gather around the table. When we hear those words, they sound something like this as we mix them together. They sound like from the Gospels on the night when our Lord Jesus took bread, he blessed it, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said to them, this is my body broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And then from the Apostle Paul, we hear that he says, for I have given you one commandment, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. When we eat from this bread and we drink from this cup from the Gospels, we do this in remembrance of him. As we join together in this sacred meal this week, you are invited to remain seated and partake of the elements as they come to you, or you are invited, if you prefer, to come forward and to receive the bread and the cup by intention which is just fancy for break off bread and dip it in the cup. Let us gather and eat from the bread and the cup of God.
I've had a dollar to my name. I've had friends that walked away. And I've even lost myself a time or two. There were bridges crossed and burned, but through all the wreckage I have learned, there is one thing that I can never lose. If I've got Jesus, I've got all that I Jesus, there's a hope that's living deep inside, a joy that I can never hide, a safe place to fall. I've got Jesus, I've got it all. I've seen weakness turn to strength. I've seen failures met with grace, and it's not from what I've done, it's Christ in me. Miracle, miracle, I can't explain. Oh, he's given me his name. I'm the richest man that I could ever be. Dan and Chris, thank you for that beautiful offering to God. Our scripture lesson this morning is from the lectionary, and I'll tell you more about that as we get into what I'm going to say about it, but it is from the lectionary. It is the fifth of those six readings on the living bread. It comes from the Gospel of John, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 51 and ending at verse 58. If you wish to stand for the reading of Holy Scripture, you are invited to do so. There is no obligation or expectation that you do so. Here begins the reading of the Holy Scripture. Listen for the word of God. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? 
So Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of the Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which our ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you join me in prayer? God, God of bread and wine. Send your Holy Spirit upon us. May the words from my mouth, the meditations in our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Anybody have scriptures they don't like? Anybody have any? Yeah. Uh, this one's one of mine. Don't like this scripture. This scripture gives me the heebie-jeebies. I just, ugh. <laughs> That's my reaction to it. And Jillian was very nice to let me wait until, actually she told me I could have till Saturday, and on Friday I did finally tell her, because I kept debating, am I going to preach on the lectionary this week or not? And I kept looking at this text, and I kept saying, not, 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 not. And then my own words came back to haunt me. You know what my words are? What have I told you about the lectionary? The reason I preach the lectionary is because it makes us deal with text that otherwise we would not deal with. And I kept reading and doing all kinds of research, and I finally said on Friday morning, okay, I'm taking on the flesh. <laughs> Let's do it. And so here we are. Now, I'm not gonna, you're not going to walk out of here and understand this text. I promise you that. But I will share with you some thoughts I've had on it, and I will share with you some history on this text and see if it will help us deal with it. This has been one of the most controversial scriptures in our New Testament. It has been argumented since the beginning of time. Oh, and I was going to tell you, too, that one of the commentators this week, that I, who, I have this wonderful commentary series that I read on the lectionary, excellent and his name is Benjamin Sparks and he begins by confessing that he and his colleagues every year this comes up in the lectionary cycle on the third year that they usually just skip it so I'm not alone in that but one of the things that we know about this text is that this text has caused problems from the very beginning it caused problems early on in that a lot of people would not become part of the Christians because they heard that they ate flesh and drank blood. And so they would reject it. As the early church began to deal with this, it has been a text of conflict forever. Some people have said this was added later. It's not part of John. Some people have said, yes, it is part of John. You're misunderstanding it. When we get as far as, I love this, by the time we get to Martin Luther, which is quite a time ago, but still 1,500 years or so into history. By the time we get to Martin Luther, there is one group of scholars who are saying, yes, this belongs to John, and yes, it is talking about Jesus' flesh, and yes, it is talking about Jesus' blood. And then you have Martin Luther who is saying, no, it is not. And Martin Luther, I'd like for you to hear some of his words from the 1500s because uh, they made me smile in their own way. Martin Luther said, he said it, give me just a second, on my little, to get between passages here, okay. Martin Luther said, he said, no, this is not about real flesh, and this is not about real blood. And his words were, 
In gist, Luther argues that when Jesus, in verse 51, speaks the words, my flesh, it is the my that defines the flesh, not the reverse. Martin Luther's words, this is not the sort of flesh from which red sausages are made, not flesh such as purchased in a butcher shop or is devoured by wolves and dogs, not veal or beef found in cow barns. And to those hearers of verse 53, this is the commentator talking right here, who may object that there is other bread of life from heaven to feed them that need not come from him, Martin Luther says this, Wittenberg beer quenches the thirst, but Annaberg beer does so too. Let them be advised by this gospel, if you do not drink Wittenberg beer, you will find no other beer to slake your thirst. So even Martin Luther has, has troubles with it, and those troubles continue today <coughs> in that people argue. And I dare say that the whole idea of transubstantiation probably came out of this text. Now, if you're not familiar with that big word, it is a form of communion that traditionally the Catholic Church has embraced. And I say traditionally because we always find people who may not in our current day, but traditionally, historically, theologically. And transubstantiation, and it's the reason why we as Protestants are not welcome when communion is served, because in transubstantiation, it is believed that when the priest says the words that the bread on the table literally becomes flesh and the wine in the cup literally becomes blood. And so therefore, to have people participate in the blood and the bread, flesh of Christ and not believe it is as such, they see as being um, heretical. Does that make sense? So that's why it's closed, because they only want people with that understanding, traditionally. That does not mean that you will not find Catholics today in different places that may not hold those same beliefs. So I dare say that transubstantiation came into being, most likely out of this text. The Lutherans have something similar called consubstantiation. Consubstantiation is the most difficult to understand, so I'm going to skip it for a second and talk about ours, which is symbolic. Symbolic is pretty easy to understand. It means when we take a loaf of bread, we say this is a symbol of Jesus' body. It's not real flesh, it's bread. And when we take grape juice or wine, depending on what we take, and we lift it up, we say this is a symbol of Jesus's blood. It's not real blood. It never was real blood in this sense. It's symbolic. So we partake of symbolic communion. The Lutherans do something called consubstantiation. And it's something between the middle of transubstantiation and symbolic. It means that when the words of institution are said that it literally becomes the body and it literally becomes the blood, but at the same time, it stays plain old bread and it stays plain old wine. Now you can wrap your brain around that, but that's why I saved it for last because it's the hardest. Um, it's like a sandwich, as one of my professors said. <laughs> you, got, you got the bread and you got it. So this text, over all of the centuries, has been highly debated, and a lot of people skip it <laughs> when it comes around. But this week, with the help of a couple of things that I read and the help of a uh, woman by the name of uh, Lind, a Reverend Lind, helped me think about this text in a different way, though her, her TED Talk on how I met God at McDonald's, which sounds like it should go with this text, right? How I met God at McDonald's was not about this text, but what she had to say helped me think about this text. <clears throat> and here's where I want to start. You'll know in communion today, 
that I took a lot of time to emphasize to you that the words we use come from Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Paul. Who did I leave out? John. There's a reason I left it out, because I think when we modern Christians hear this text, we hear it with ears who know Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because we do. We hear it with ears of a people who are familiar with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who meet Jesus the night of the Passover, hear him break bread, say, this is my body, hear him take a cup and say, this is my blood. Now, what we often either don't know or don't remember is that there is no Last Supper in the book of John. Because in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Last Supper takes place on the night of Passover. In John, Jesus washes the disciples' feet before Passover. When he is eating with them in John, it is the day of the preparation of lamb, of the lamb of God. And in John, John wants us to make sure that we understand that the Passover lamb that is sacrificed in John is Jesus. And the way he makes sure we know that is Jesus is crucified on the day of the Passover as the lambs are being slaughtered. So Jesus in John never gathers with them at a table and says, this is my body broken for you, this is my blood. He does say to a woman at the well about water, drink this living water and you will never thirst. He does say to a crowd of 5,000, he does talk about this bread and right after it where we are, the living bread. Make sense? He talks about the living water, the living bread. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when we stop to eat this meal, we are doing it in remembrance. Remembrance. There's nothing in John about remembrance. What we have in John is an emphasis upon the living water, the living bread. So I'm going to offer you a possible way to look at this text. Not the, necessarily the right one, because Lord knows if historians and theologians for 2,000 years have not agreed upon it, Anel certainly doesn't have the wisdom to tell you what it's like. But something that I came to live with it this week on how I can live with this text and that is our um, pastor, Lynn, who tells about how she met God in McDonald's, talks about how she has this inner conversation that she knows is God. She says, I call it God. And it's a great TED Talk. I advise you uh, look at it. And she talks about this whole conversation that she has with God and one of the things that God tells her in this conversation is she, she's asking questions and God says, because I live in every, I live in you and I live in every person. I live in every person. Now her experiences how we access that living God, that living Christ within us. She goes about what it meant for her, and she even recognizes that different people call it different things. Some people may call it your conscience. Some people may call it God. She talks about all of that. But what she emphasizes is the thing that she learned in this experience, or one of the things, was that each one of us, which fits with what we understand as being made out of the creation of God, is that not a remembrance, but a living Christ within us. And so how I have come now to read this passage is to not 
dwell so much on the flesh and blood other than the fact that it means to take it in and to become a part of yourself and that within us is a living peace of Christ or a living peace of God, what is most comfortable for you. And if we will enter into conversation and listen, ask, listen, be patient and wait for response, that we will have life abundant. Because it's not about a remembrance. It's about a living reality that is within each of us. It's not something Anel has that Jillian doesn't or that Jillian has and Anel doesn't or that Lisa doesn't or that Doris doesn't or uh, that um, Debbie has. It's something we all have. We don't have to find it just within ourselves. We don't have to go out on a hunt for it. We already have it. It is within us. The living God already dwells within you. Already. And it is the life that will give you meaning and joy. And as Joe says, when you do something when you love what you do, you do in what you love, and vice versa, when you do what you love. And when we are doing that, when we are serving and we're filled with joy, then we have just reached in and touched and begun to communicate with that living God within us. So, nothing profound can't solve all the historian questions about it. But for me, this week, this is how I came to, no pun intended, digest this little piece of scripture and bring it into something that could make sense to me today. May God bless you with the living God and spirit within you. You are already a part of our family if you are just here with us today. But if you want to be officially made a part, if you will, ra uh, not you raise your hand, we're not going to make you stand out, but if all of our elders will raise their hands, and Jillian, that we will let you know that you can talk to any one of us and we can help you become a member of this church. If you would like to come forward to do that, we welcome that as well, but it's not necessary. Please stand with me and sing our hymn of invitation, which is down by the riverside.
blessing of the book bags, book packs, right, Jillian? All right, next Sunday, blessing of the book packs. Does that mean bring your book packs? Is that what that means? Bring your book pack, students, and we will bless them and bless you. We'd rather bless you than them, but we're, we're blessing you through them. Doesn't mean you get straight A's. <laughs> Go out into the world in peace. Go out into the world and stop and pause and seek within yourself that living God, that living Christ. Look for it. Embrace it. I promise you there will be joy. And I promise you that it will bring you life. Life that is abundant and life that is full. Go out with peace. Go out with grace. And share that love with everyone you meet. Amen. I know